Scott and Dalen here with Rescue Methods. <clears throat> We're going to reinforce the FR1 article for this month on resultant force. Um, we're talking about portable high directional anchors here. We're going to try and do this step by step and just kind of illustrate some of the key foundations or essentials when it comes to using portable high directional anchors. The first thing we want to talk about is the footprint. Whether we're using a bipod, a monopod, or a tripod, they're all going to create a footprint. <clears throat> it's a point print, a linear print, or a surface area print. In a tripod application, we've got surface area because we've got three definitive points, or three feet. We've got nice orange hobble straps from CMC here. We're using the Arizona Vortec. And these, these hobble straps clearly lay out for us what the footprint is. The footprint print is connecting all those points and looking at this interior triangle, okay? The importance of the footprint is when we rig up to the head of these portable high directional anchors. The forces applied through our lowering and hauling operations need to generate a resultant force that lands somewhere within these boundaries, okay? So just to illustrate that quickly, if I haul straight down and straight up, this is gonna be basically the resultant force as it progresses down. It's gonna end up right in the center mass point of this triangle. When you're rigged like this, this is a very, very stable platform. We don't have to do any additional rigging as far as back ties and tensioning and uh, any, any strapping that we're gonna put onto the legs or into the feet or into the head. As soon as we start changing this angle of up and down and right center mass here, we start changing where that resultant force goes. So I'm gonna illustrate it first on the pull. If I take this line and I run it back to an anchor somewhere outside of this system, okay? As soon as I pull on this rope, I have the ability to possibly overload or topple this system. And it's all dependent on the line that bisects this interior angle, okay? That's what the resultant is. So as I open this up and I look at this angle and bisect it, it's going to create a line that's going to end up with a point on the ground. If that point is outside of this triangle, I have to do additional rigging to prevent this system from toppling over. If I want that point and that line to work their way back into the, to the footprint, I need to close this angle up, okay? <clears throat> Conversely, the load can be the problem. So I may still be hauling up here close to this point, but if we've got an entry point that's outside of the footprint, even though I'm hauling and lowering from here potentially, We've opened that angle up again, and as the load pulls on that line, we've got to find the resultant coming out of that again, and now we're shifting that to the front side, okay? Anytime these resultant forces exit the perimeter of the footprint, we're going to have to apply basically resistant forces. So we're going to call them tensioning back, to back ties, adjustable back ties, things that are going to uh, resist or oppose that force and that linear point, or that point that we're creating with the resultant force. Go ahead and come back in with that load there, Scott. So in its simplest explanation that I could try and communicate, that's the basic premise of resultant force. We're gonna use a uh, digital slope finder real quick just to kind of illustrate this so that everybody can see it. Okay, so with our digital slope finder in place to illustrate the resultant force, you can see right here, with the angle we've created, we're at about 60 to 70 degrees, okay? So if I'm gonna find the bisecting point of this, I'm gonna move this until I'm at about 35 degrees. I'm coming in, I'm coming in, and then as soon as I'm at 35 degrees, which is right about there, this plane would create a point. Wherever that point hits the ground, again, if it's inside of the footprint, I'm relatively stable. The closer we get to an individual leg or foot or to the boundaries or perimeters of the footprint, the more likely we are to overload that one leg, underload the other legs, and start to generate instability. So if we found that this point was generating way too far back towards the boundary, we would simply want to close this angle up by walking this load in, moving our anchor closer, uh, closer to this system or by putting another directional pulley on that and just redirecting that line to close this up. Now we're at 30 degrees, so if we bisect that, we're going to bring this all the way into 15 degrees, and that's our resultant. You can see that that resultant right there is much closer to the center point of the footprint. So basic theory about resultant force. Now it can get a lot more
Okay, so one of the easiest ways to fix uh, a resultant force, a standard setup where the resultant is outside of the footprint, it's based on us producing a lateral pull. Okay, in some way, shape, or form that wants to pull this head over in a certain direction. One of the easiest ways to fix that is to just redirect that pull line. We can still pull laterally, but what we'll do, if this were a manhole entry right here, and we needed a, a hull team working outside of the work area, and they want to pull sideways on this, instead of them just pulling straight out and creating a resultant force that falls outside of the footprint, we're going to hang a pulley on this line. We're going to bring this pulley as a change of direction back down towards the hole. There's a variety of ways to rig this. Um, we can rig the foot or to the feet of our system. I prefer not to, so if we have a sufficient bomb-proof anchor set up within this entry point, a ladder well, rungs where we can grab multiple elements and then run an extender anchor strap up through there and hang this just above the entry point, you see if Scott puts just a little bit of pressure on that line, tensions it up, we've now redirected the resultant so that it's coming straight back down into the footprint as opposed to leaving this wide open and shooting that resultant outside of the footprint. So just remember one of your first easiest fixes is if you got to do a lateral pull, simply redirect the line with a change of direction pulley. The next segment we're going to get into is back ties. So if we need a lateral pull and we can't redirect the line, or if we need to articulate or beam out the tripod, bipod, monopod, then we're going to start looking at tensioning elements that we're going to put on the head and the feet to resist those forces. Okay, so now we have basically beamed forward our tripod, extended our back leg. When you do this, uh, we're going to start by saying you don't want to pass these front legs past a perpendicular point um, initially. If you pass them past a perpendicular point, then not only do we have to resist with oppositional force what's going on at the head, we also have to consider what's going on at the feet. So as soon as we beam forward further, if we load this top, not only does the head want to topple over, but the feet want to kick back. So now we're talking about two different directions of resistant forces with back ties. One from the head going to the rear, and one from the feet going to the front. If we're working on a cliff edge, uh, there's really no way to create tensioning elements going to the front. So we're going to look at pinning applications. Or in the case of the Arizona Vortec, we have other feet option. that can actually embed themselves into the ground, provided the ground provides us enough shear resistance to withstand those type of, of applications. So we're going to keep this just perpendicular for now to illustrate this next point. You see we've got our rope coming in, rope coming out. Here's our load. And just naturally, as this load comes down, you can see it's basically right on the front surface of the footprint. Now, being in the front, uh, within the imprint here, even if I pull force on this, and Scott pulls force back, and we kind of load this tripod, you can see we're not losing a ton of stability because we're still within that footprint. But the second I move this load outside of this and start to load this, we now are going to start picking up that back leg and potentially moving this tripod forward. We start developing that instability. If we need to clear this edge, and this is how we're going to be loading on this tripod, one of the quickest, easiest ways to resist this force is to create an adjustable back tie coming off the head back towards our anchor point. So you can see back here we're using an Arizona or a uh, CMC Aztec. You can see back here we're using a uh, CMC Aztec here. <clears throat> We've got this rigged in. It's a four to one, five to one, depending on how we configure it with capturing uh, Prusix. We're gonna grab this and we're gonna tension this. Now, when you tension these, you gotta be conscientious about it because if we just start hauling and over tension, we're actually gonna underload how this is positioned without any load on us. We can just as readily pull it back. So Scott applies a little bit of attention. We're gonna apply a little bit of load and we're just gonna keep working these two back and forth until they're set at about the position we want them with as much stability as possible on this setup. Once that is tensioned, we now have the ability to pull out to the front portion and start loading this without creating a lot of instability in the tripod. Go ahead and give me a little more tension on there, Scott. Good. So that's the objective you're looking for. You're just working them back and forth until you get this nice and pressurized basically and set. One of the challenges with this is when load comes on and off of the rope. So that's why we want to ensure that you're just kind of uh, methodical about how you go about this. We don't over tension that back portion. We don't under tension this front portion. 
So that explains beaming this forward, beaming this out, and basically changing the presentation of where this is, where your resultant force is. If we look at the resultant force component with this, if Scott takes that line and we were to run it all the way back to the anchor back there, and we were to open up this here, if we were to look at how this angle is, calculate our resultant force, it's gonna put us back inside of this position, hopefully get us what we're looking for to create that stability and make sure that that resultant force is pinpointing inside of the footprint. Okay, now we've quickly progressed to a bipod application. With bipods, when we're center mass, is all that's really necessary on the feet as a hobble strap. Now, when we're talking about the footprint here, this is where we're talking about a linear footprint. So because we don't have a third or fourth leg, there's no way to create a surface area for footprint. It's just simply a linear footprint. What that tells us is, as long as this resultant force is on this line, <clears throat> we're not gonna cause a lot of instability to the load. We still have to create back ties. Uh, we're using the Aztecs again, going to the head of the system so that we can control any movement going this way. But as soon as we start moving this load outside and away from that line, you can see how we can overload one leg and basically underload this leg, okay? The other important facet of this is as these start to beam forward, the feet become inherently unstable, all right? We're gonna hit a point where as we progress, the feet on this are gonna to wanna to kick back or slide back in the opposite direction. So we either need to create shear resistance by using um, different feet that basically embed themselves in the surface that we're working on, or by pinning the feet into the surface we're working on, or by hobbling or tensioning those feet to another anchor or another element up towards this working surface in the opposite direction. So, here, center mass, resultant force right down on the line, we're in good shape. If Scott were to loosen his Aztec up and we were to start bringing this bipod this way, go ahead and uh, loosen this up, Scotty. I got it up here, just mind your end. Okay, we'll send it the other way. You ready, Jake? Yeah. Scotty, you're gonna pull. Okay, go ahead. Okay, as we start to beam this bipod forward, and we're moving the orientation, as well as the resultant force away from the hobble strap and the line, we're gonna develop a lot more instability in the, the relationship between the bases or the feet and the surface that we're working off of, okay? So we set here. Um, if we come on up to this side, there are some maximum allowances on this. So if we're looking at this directly from the side on presentation, we don't want to typically take just two bipod legs past uh, a 45 degree mark when they're loaded. Remember the rope stretches, if we beam these all the way out to 45 degrees and then manage this back tie right there and haven't really put a, an assumptive load on here, then when we load it, if we stretch out that back tie at that 45 degree mark, we can readily just walk the system over. So we always wanna make sure that we are somewhere between 45 degrees and upright when we're beaming out a bipod like this. As we load this system and continue to pull more and more this way, we continue to generate less and less stability on those feet. So that's where we either need to pin, put in the claw feet or the feet that embed themselves into the working surface, or create tension back ties coming towards this direction of pull. Bipod application.